I'm so glad to be here, happiest time of the year. Uh, this will be your best academic experience. For those of you, it's your first time here at Mises U. Um, so glad you're here. Enjoy it. Get as much out of it um, <clears throat> this week. You'll look back on this later when you're my age and think that was the best. So uh, we're going to talk about money, uh, what it is, why we all want it. Um, we have at the Mises Institute, at Mises University, we're going to have money um, the very first day, one of our um, uh, most important topics, um, and it's central in Austrian economics. The reason why is we're going to have an all our analysis is going to be done in money prices. Uh, calculation, which you'll learn about later in the week, is only possible with money prices. And as we learned from Dr. Rittenauer, um, money uh, or division of labor, and we'll see how that leads to money, it allows civilization really to develop. Um, uh, money is very um, important in Austrian economics. Uh, some of our most important contributions, Carl Minger's uh, book in 19, I'm sorry, 1892, uh, developed the theory of money. 20 years later, um, Mises in 1912 expanded on Minger's approach with the re regression theorem. Uh, his first book was Theory of Money and Credit, some light reading for your beach trip this summer. Um, other great works by Murray Rothbard, What Has Government Done to Our Money, highly recommend, and my favorite is The Mystery of Banking. Um, if not for Austrians, we might still have the state theory of money, that money is really whatever the state says it is, and the currency has its value just from the sovereign's decree. So that's why we need to talk about money on the first day. Um, by the end of this week, you're going to be well-versed in why this price inflation we're experiencing now, um, it's not because of COVID. It's not because of Putin's price. It's not a Putin price hike. It's not because of the supply chain, but it's really the chickens coming home to roost. It's the payoff of this wildly irresponsible monetary policy we've had really since 2008. So um, <clears throat> let's start with a question uh, let's start with the question, who needs money? Uh, old Robinson Crusoe, a man on the island by himself, he would have no need for money. Can't eat gold coins. Uh, there's no shopping mall for him to go spend money. So um, he has no need for money. And then eventually he meets Friday on the island, his friend, island, uh, his friend Friday. And even then... The two of them, they have no need for uh, money because when they're exchanging fish and berries, they can just do that based on their subjective valuations of the goods. But uh, when society expands beyond just a few families, then the stage is set for the emergence of money. So um, <clears throat> remember, uh, voluntary exchange happens because both parties expect to benefit, both parties expect to be better off from this exchange. And um, from Dr. Rittenauer's lecture, uh, you know, there are differences in people's abilities. You know, we can't all play basketball like Michael Jordan. Um, we have different abilities. And then also there are differences in locations. So just based on that, there comes the impetus for us to exchange, specialization exchange through division of labor. Um, we each develop our best skill and each re region can develop its own particular resources. So we found that we're better off, more productive, more efficient, um, more productive when we're producing a limited number of goods and relying on what we get for most of what we're going to consume from exchanging with others as opposed to being self-sufficient as opposed to um, imagine, I mean, I was saying many of you look very nice. All of you look nice. I'm not leaving anybody out. You all look very nice. Most of us did not make our own clothes when we came here. We looked a lot nicer because of that. So um, <clears throat> we have a higher standard of living um, through exchange rather than being self-sufficient. So um, <clears throat> exchange of goods for goods, we're exchanging goods against goods under barter. Um, it turns out it's hardly better. It's very um, uh, prefer it's barely preferable to being self-sufficient. So uh, barter has 
two basic problems. There are a lot of problems, the two ones that we're going to discuss. One is indivisibilities of the goods that are being, ex that are being exchanged, and also double coincidence of wants requirement. So uh, this spring at our house in Waco, Texas, we put a pool in our backyard. Um, that's our actual pool. We put a pool in our backyard. Um, and pools, if you don't know, it's the first time I've ever had a pool in my backyard, but pools are very expensive. But this one did come with a really cute pool boy. <laughs> so um, uh, let's imagine, let's imagine put in a, putting in a pool under conditions of barter. Um, now, I teach economics at Baylor University, and not surprisingly, I am really popular. And my classes are in high demand, no pun intended. Um, my classes always fill and have very long, wait, very long waiting lists to get in. In fact, here's a picture that the registrar took of students begging for my class. <laughs> There they are. Um, so naturally, if I'm bartering to get a, uh, to get a pool, um, naturally, if I'm bartering, I bring a lot to the table with my fabulous economics lectures, right? With my economics lectures, I come with a lot of value. Um, however, as amazing as my lectures are, what if the pool is even more valuable? What if the pool is, say, even four times as valuable as my economics lectures? What could Paco, Paco the pool builder, there he is, um, digging a hole in our backyard. What could Paco the pool builder do if his pool building is four times more valuable than my economics lectures? Could he just dig a hole in my backyard? You can see there's the hole um, in the backyard. Could you just stop there? Could he maybe just build 25% of a pool? Say, put in one wall of the pool and then just stop. Well, a fourth of a pool is not going to be a pool at all because you need more sides of that. You need at least three, at least a triangle, right, for it to be able to hold water. So trading goods that are not easily divisible, like a swimming pool, it's going to be a hindrance to trade under barter. So um, even when goods are divisible into smaller units, though, it's very difficult for two exchangers to find each other under barter. In barter, a double coincidence of wants is required for exchange to take place. I have to have what you want, you have to have what I want, and we have to find each other. So, for example, um, if I have these incredibly passionate, eloquent, moving lectures, uh, explains economics so clearly, it's intuitive, uh, intuitively obvious to the most casual observer where they would really just, you know, go away, change from economics lectures. Um, and Paco, he can put in this beautiful pool. How are Paco and I going to get together if Paco's not interested in economics? Instead, he really wants to learn art history. So then we're, there's no exchange that's going to take place. So for the survival of my economics professor colleagues, I'm so glad we don't live under barter any longer. Think of us trying to find food in exchange for our economics lectures. In fact, y'all, I can't believe I was able to get this, but I have an actual photo of some of our Mises University faculty when they were uh, living under barter conditions. So there's uh, Salerno, Gordon Klein. So, uh, <clears throat> So with uh, barter, we've got the indivisibilities and we have the double coincidence of wants requirement. One other problem is because every good trades against every other good, um, there would have to be, each good would have to have a whole array of prices. Each good is going to be in price in terms of every other good. Um, so in a barter economy with only a thousand goods, there would be almost a half a million prices. Okay. Uh, for a sense of scale, the average, I should say, pre-COVID, pre-supply chain problems, Walmart, uh, the average Walmart store carries over 120,000 goods. So under barter, um, the prices, uh, that's above my math level, um, the number of prices would be, <clears throat> somebody else can calculate that for me. But anyway, Mises said, um, money becomes more necessary as division of labor increases and wants become more refined. As we have greater degree of division of labor, um, we can finally have our rocket science. 
um, like uh, Dr. Rittenauer was talking about, we can finally have a rocket science when only really when we have a monetary economy. It's really clear from these examples that any sort of developed, uh, mo uh, any sort of developed modern um, economy is only going to be possible with um, money. It would not be possible under direct exchange or barter. Okay, so under indirect exchange, you're selling your product that you have that you're going to market to exchange. You're selling it not for the good that you need directly uh, in indirect exchange. You're exchanging it for another good that then you can in turn turn around and exchange it for the good that you want. And at first this seems like, gosh, this is just adding an extra clumsy step. Isn't this more complicated now? Um, I want to go get bananas and I have to make two exchanges, the good that I want for something else and then I go get bananas. But it's actually, it's a really incredible instrument that allows civilization to develop. Um, under barter, we can imagine that all the goods are going to have a different degree of saleability, how marketable they are. Uh, the more saleable a good, the more easily the owner of it could exchange it for other goods at some price. Okay, somebody selling potatoes has an advantage over me if what I have is a great big chandelier. I'm coming in with like a big old chandelier and I'm looking for somebody to trade it with, right? So I'm going to have a harder time. The big chandelier, I have a more difficult time finding trading partners. Who's coming to market looking for a big chandelier? Of course, it's not impossible, especially if I'll accept a low price, right? If I'll be willing to accept a lower price for my chandelier, then I'm going to be able to trade it more easily. Uh, but a chandelier, clearly on this scale of saleability, uh, potatoes are more saleable than chandeliers. So the owners of the relatively less saleable goods will exchange their goods uh, not only for what, I, what we want to consume, but for goods we don't directly wish to consume. Um, so long as the good that I receive in my trade is more saleable than the good that I give up. As long as I'm going from uh, big chandelier to something that is more saleable, that puts me in a better position to get closer to the good that I do want to have. Over time, Minger argued the most saleable goods uh, were desired by more and more traders because everybody recognizes this advantage. Um, the demand for this very saleable good changes then. Um, so it's not only demanded for its use value. We're buying potatoes not just because we want to have baked potatoes, mashed potatoes, french fries. But we're buying these because also I'm, potatoes are more marketable. Potatoes are more saleable. So I have this, the potatoes then have this demand that's for its use and also this other component of the demand for is a medium of exchange. Um, and the choice of the good or goods as medium of exchange is a gradual self-reinforcing process. As more people accept it, um, then the commodity becomes even more saleable and more, uh, more and more, therefore, accepted. I've heard Bob Murphy make the point that um, we don't know how long this adoption process takes, but we can imagine that it may not take a very long time, right? It may happen. It may be recognized very quickly. We don't have... Um, you know, really uh, historical accounts of that, but just imagining people recognizing um, the benefits <clears throat> of the uh, marketable or saleable medium of exchange, it might happen fairly quickly. Um, okay, so what makes a good more likely to become accepted as a medium of exchange? Uh, well, if it's easily divisible, not like a swimming pool, if it's easily divisible into smaller units without losing value. Uh, if it's durable, it holds its value over long periods of time while changing hands frequently. Also, if it's easily transportable, um, if it has a high value to weight ratio, right, that's going to make it easier for you to carry a little bit of it in your pocket and you still have a good uh, value to exchange. Also, it's fungible. One unit of money is basically equivalent to any other unit. Also, it needs to be scarce. Um, eventually, one or two commodities are used as a generally accepted medium of exchange. That is, in almost all exchanges, the commonly accepted medium of exchange, then it's called money once it's generally accepted. 
So um, historically, uh, we've had lots of goods that have served as money. We've had uh, beads, bread, shells, nails, other examples. Um, you hear about the, the fascinating case where cigarettes and the prisoner of war camps served as money. Um, through the centuries, though, two commodities, um, gold and silver, has dis have displaced the other commodities as a generally accepted medium of exchange. <clears throat> um, and some critics, they'll make fun of Austrians. Um, they'll call us gold bugs. Like, we just love it because it's shiny, and uh, we have some kind of obsession uh, with these shiny objects. But that's not it at all. I mean, gold happens to be the commodity that the market has chosen because it fits these characteristics really the best. Um, but we'd be just as happy if the market had chosen some other commodity that worked just as well. Uh, Carl Minger pointed out it's not necessary, even conceivable, for money to be established by some authoritarian decree or by an explicit contract among the citizens. Um, in fact, no historical record of any uh, government's creation <clears throat> of money can be found, even though I don't think that's the strongest argument to say we don't have a, a historical record of it, but it just it doesn't make sense. The more plausible explanation is that money originates spontaneously because uh, the immediate and obvious benefit of using the more marketable good as a medium of exchange is recognized just by the parties involved. They recognize this is easier, more convenient, this makes sense for me, and so I adopt it. And that happens. So it's hard to really imagine of anybody coming up with this idea of money or a medium of exchange without actually experience it, experiencing it. Okay, so Minger said, uh, hence it's also clear that nothing may have been so favorable to the genesis of a medium of exchange as the acceptance on the part of the most discerning and capable economic subjects for their own economic gain and over a considerable period of time of eminently saleable goods in preference to all others. Uh, and that is from on the origins of money. So uh, money is unlikely to originate in any other way uh, because um, embedded in the demand for money is this knowledge of the money prices that that had when it was a commodity, when you were demanding it for use. So you have this knowledge of these past prices. Um, <clears throat> so uh, unlike consumption goods, money has to have these pre-existing prices that we can ground our demand for it on this, this knowledge of what is this going to exchange for. I knew what this exchange for before it was a medium of exchange. Now I know that and I can have an idea when I go and exchange my goods for this medium of exchange. Mises' regression theorem explains this can only happen beginning um, <clears throat> with a subjectively useful commodity under barter um, and only then adding a demand, this other component of demand for this good as a medium of exchange. Um, <clears throat> to the demand of the good that you had for it when it was just come out you're demanding for your use. Okay, uh, how do we go from, we're not trading in gold coins now, how do we go from uh, commodity money to a paper currency? Well, paper doesn't have very much intrinsic value, and people, when they... Uh, you know, you have to work hard to be able to have nice things. And you have, you've produced these goods, that's a fruit of your labor. Uh, people are not willing, would not be willing to surrender these real goods that they have produced in exchange for worthless pieces of paper. Um, so how do we go from paying with commodity money uh, to paying with paper? Well, carrying around gold, I mean, it is heavy, right? It's heavier than paper. Um, and you worry about the dangers of somebody um, clunking you over the head and taking your gold that you're lugging around, you know, in your, in your sack on your back. So um, <clears throat> people, uh, for their own convenience um, and security, they put their gold in secure warehouses and they had paper claims um, or receipts for the units of gold that were stored in there. Um, to make purchases instead of going to the warehouse, getting their gold out, 
and going to make the exchange with their gold, for convenience, they started paying just with the paper claims. Here's the receipt I have. I have this many units of gold here. I'm signing over this much of it to you for your bicycle or whatever. So eventually, the paper claims to the gold commodity money became generally accepted medium of exchange, where everybody was trading in these trading in these claims to gold. <clears throat> okay, so um, once we have once we have a monetary economy and we all have a generally accepted medium of exchange, most transactions are happening being paid with this um, with this money. Uh, all the problems of barter are gone. We don't have to worry about indivisibilities. We don't have to worry about double coincidence of wants. Also, there's a great reduction in the number of prices now. Every good is now priced in one unit, and it's the money unit. So uh, all of them are, uh, everything is priced, and it has only one, uh, everything only has one price. Um, you've already seen that without money, there could be no real specialization um, and therefore no advancement of the economy. But now that we have money, now we can have an elaborate structure of production um, that can be formed, uh, land, labor services, capital goods, cooperating to advance production at each stage of production, and each, are each one of them are receiving payment in money. Um, and only with the establishment of money can we have rational economic calculation. Um, now businessmen can determine if they are earning profits or losses, um, because both revenues and costs are going to be denominated in the same units, right? It's not um, one cow was my revenue minus bushel of wheat and three, you know, sacks of oranges. Now everything is denominated in the same same units. Um, <clears throat> Also with money, people can compare the market worth of each good, compare the worth of one good to the worth of another. So uh, if we have a gaming laptop computer, it costs about one ounce of gold, and we know a new stripped-down basic Ford Escape costs 20 ounces of gold. Cars have gotten so expensive. Have y'all seen this lately? Uh, so if a basic entry-level Ford Escape costs 20 ounces of gold. It's easy we can see, everybody can see if, that the Escape is worth about 20 gaming computers. So um, most uh, physical goods are sold in terms of units of weight. Um, and the size of the unit of weight, whether it's an ounce or a pound or a gram, it doesn't matter because each one of those can be converted uh, into another one. Remember with units of measurement, elementary school, you had to learn, well, if you're in the United States, you had to learn 12 inches is a foot, right? Okay, so uh, so same thing with weight. Um, they're all convertible. One pound is 16 ounces, and one ounce is 28.35 grams. So it doesn't matter which size we choose for the, uh, for the currency. I can sell something for one ounce in the U.S., or I can sell it for 28.35 grams in France, and these are the same price. Um, this all seems very obvious, um, but because people forget the simple truth, there's a lot of confusion. Um, people didn't, uh, didn't think of um, money as being, uh, a dollar as being uh, representative of so many ounces of gold, right? It was, um, everybody thought money is the units or some kind of uh, esoteric something. Um, <clears throat> even when we're on the gold standard, people thought in terms like this, um, American money is dollars, French money is francs, German money is marks, etc. cetera. Um, but really, all of those were tied to gold. And because they were considered sovereign and independent monies, uh, people were just used to thinking of their names, thinking of here's a dollar, here's a franc. Um, it was easy for countries to go off the gold standard. Um, this made it. A, this made um, exchange rates very confusing, but it's really um, it's really simple when you remember that these uh, <clears throat> before government fiat money, the names were really just names for a weight of some commodity of gold. Um, on the gold standard before 1933, people used to say that the price of gold was fixed at twenty dollars an ounce. Okay, 
that's really a backwards way of saying the correct way of looking at it would be to say the dollar was the name given for one twentieth of an ounce of gold. Um, because this misunderstanding of the monies being names for units of weight of gold was misleading um, to talk about exchange rates of one country's currency for another, but it's really simple. Um, the pound sterling did not exchange for $5. The dollar was at that time defined as 1 20th of an ounce of gold. Uh, the pound sterling was 1 4th of an ounce of gold. Okay, so they said the pound sterling changed for exchange for $5. It was really a fourth of an ounce of gold exchanged for 5 20ths of an ounce of gold. And so 5 20th reduces to what? One fourth. Okay, so we're going to stay in school, learn our fractions. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so uh, what about the specific value of money? What is the price of money? I think it's easier to think to uh, understand this if we think of it first with some other good besides money. Let's take uh, my laptop. Um, if I take my laptop to the market to sell, how much money could it command in the market? I think because my laptop, I've had it since 2019, maybe I could get $100 for it. Okay, so the purchasing power of my laptop is then when I go to the market, it's going to buy me $100. Or I could say that $1 buys how much of my laptop? One one hundredth of my laptop. It's the same thing with money. If I sell this money, what can I get in exchange? The laptop just traded for money, but money trades for everything else. So we need to list all the possibilities of what a dollar trades for. So $1 could buy one one hundredth of my laptop. Uh, one dollar could buy one pack of gum. My daughter says it's more now like two thirds of a pack. So Jimmy Fallon's thank you notes. Thank you, Federal Reserve. Um, or uh, one dollar buys one thirty thousandth of a car. Um, so uh, what then is the purchasing power of money? It's this whole array of all the quantities of the other goods and services that it commands in exchange. So the purchasing power of the dollar is going to be the inverse, like we've seen here, the inverse or the reciprocal of the price level. So if we have a doubling of prices, then the purchasing power of money is cut in half. So if the laptop is now $200, so instead of buying one one-hundredth of a laptop, it only buys one two-hundredth of a laptop. Um, <clears throat> so the price level rises, the purchasing power of the money falls. So the purchasing power of money um, can be thought of really as the price of money, where the price or the value of money is going to be determined by supply and demand, just like supply and demand for any other uh, good is going to determine its value and exchange in the market. So if there's an increase in the supply of money, we find that its value and exchange is going to fall. Just like there's an increase in supply of anything else, its value and exchange is going to fall. There's a de decrease in supply, its value and exchange is going to rise. And it's the opposite with demand. If there's an increase in demand for money, its value and exchange rises. If there's a decrease in demand for money, its value and exchange falls. And we should point out here that um, uh, the demand for money is not just how much money do I want. The demand for money is, we call it, uh, demand for money is the amount of money we should hold in cash balances. Um, so what is the optimal um, supply of money? We always hear about the Federal Reserve is increasing, expanding the money supply. Now they're tightening the money supply. They're always tinkering with it in some way. Um, and what should the supply be? Uh, is there this optimal amount that we're finally going to achieve? Okay, now this is the amount of money that we should have in the economy? What is the, uh, what is the optimal amount and would there be any reason why that optimal amount should change? Um, Rothbard pointed out that's a really a silly question. Nobody ever asks the question, what's the optimal supply of pizzas? You know, what's the right number of tennis shoes to have in the economy? Um, <clears throat> an increase in consumer and producer goods, which we, we consume, we use up, they wear out, um, an increase in those goods would make us better off because those goods are consumed and they're satisfying our wants, right? Um, but money is different, right? As a medium of exchange, money is not used up, okay? Money is not destroyed. It's just transferred from one cash balance to another. So that's why 
any money supply, any amount of money is just as good as any other money supply amount of money in performing the medium of exchange function. So purchasing power of money always adjusts, purchasing power of money, the value in exchange of money adjusts to permit the exchanges to, all the exchanges to um, take place. All the exchanges we want to have uh, can happen whether our uh, money supply is 20 billion or 200 billion. Um, the price level would rise. With the higher price level, or sorry, with the higher money supply, price level would be higher. With the lower money supply, the price level would be lower um, <clears throat> so that every exchange could be facilitated. So we can see the effects of the increase in money supply of the Angel Gabriel model. Um, in this model, we have a benevolent but very economically ignorant um, spirit decides, um, comes down, uh, descends, decides to come down and try to benefit humankind um, one night by magically doubling the cash balances everybody has while they sleep. So everybody wakes up in the morning, discovers their cash balances have been doubled, and um, <clears throat> they have excess cash balances, so they rush out and prices, prices have not changed, right? The only thing that's changed is our cash balance. We have extra cash, we rush out, and um, we rush out to go spend this excess money on consumer and producer goods, okay? The result then is an increase in demand for all those goods, and then therefore, when the, uh, the increase in demand for something, the price of it rises. So we have a, the result will be a doubling of the price level. So society is no better off and no additional wants are going to be satisfied um, from Angel Gabriel's doubling our cash balances. Um, all the consumer goods, productive resources, they are all the same. There are no more of those to, um, to meet more additional, uh, to meet no more of those to meet additional wants and needs. So despite the angels doubling the number of monetary units, the real money supply, which is the money supply divided by the price level, has remained the same. So the purchasing power of money has just been cut in half. So you see how that works, we were talking about before. So sort of a little bit more closely at what Angel Gabriel did, was that some people were actually benefited at the expense of other people, even though all received the same proportional increase in their cash balances. The people who woke up the early birds, or as I call them the freaks, the early birds woke up early to discover their cash balance had been doubled, and so they rushed out. These people tend to be impulsive. They rushed out and they um, bought at yesterday's prices, but when they, in doing so, they bid up those prices, prices rose. Um, those who slept in, smart people, or waited a few days, not as impulsive, um, before spending the money, they lost out. Um, because they made their purchases with the extra money after the prices have risen and their cash balances have decreased um, in purchasing power. So the increase in money supply did not benefit society as a whole, but early spenders are benefited at the expense of late spenders. Um, <clears throat> since every money supply is equally optimal and a larger money supply is no more beneficial than a smaller money supply, nobody including economists, including the Federal Reserve. Nobody need be concerned with what the optimal um, supply of money is. Um, <clears throat> under the gold standard, the one and only way to increase money supply would be mining. You'd have to dig gold out of the ground. Okay? Uh, mining, um, that production process, uh, requires the use of scarce resources and therefore it's costly. So we're only going to be mining gold as a productive <clears throat> endeavor uh, if it's profitable, right? And the profitability of mining is going to be affected by the cost of mining, right? So if the costs fall, that means mining is more profitable, so we would mine more gold. Um, if the costs rise, then produ production is going to be less profitable and we would uh, decrease our mining activity or maybe even shut it down altogether. So one factor that's affecting the cost of gold production is the price level, 
which is affected by um, changes in the money supply. So when the price level rises, uh, the prices used in mining, or uh, sorry, the cost of the resources used in mining gold uh, will also increase and um, gold protection would, would decline. The opposite would occur, of course, when the price level fell. <clears throat> So we should point out that um, with commodity money, uh, like gold or, uh, gold or silver, that an increase in that does have a benefit in society because part of this increase in the gold or silver uh, goes into consumption, right? It's not all used as a medium of exchange, but we can have more jewelry, electronics, those things. Um, so you can get gold by buying it or mining it. You can also get it fraudulently by counterfeiting it. Now, one is to look at the effects of counterfeiting so we can better understand um, the inflation process. So let's say some bad guys get together. They mint some counterfeit coins. Uh, they're actually made of brass instead of gold. And they're, you know, to the naked eye, untrained eye, they are not easily detected. They go, uh, these brass coins are spent um, and not detected. So they spend these fakes and that's increasing the money supply <clears throat> and um, increasing also the demand for goods. And they go out and spend these fakes. Um, that increase the price level um, is going to decrease the purchasing power of money. It's just like the Angel Gabriel model, except for one crucial distinction. The, the key here is that the fake money enters into the economy. It's not spread out over all of us. It's not where all of us have our cash balance is doubled, it enters in a specific point in the economy. Um, and then it spreads uh, throughout the economy <clears throat> as it, the fake coins get spent and re-spent over and over. The result is going to be that the demand for the local goods, where the counterfeiters, the bad guys were, uh, the prices of those goods will increase first. Um, and then it spreads until eventually all prices are affected. So the counterfeiters, they're like the early birds, the ones who went out and spent first. Uh, they spent the money early in the process, and they benefit at the expense of those who get the money late in the process or not at all. Think of the people who are on fixed incomes. They are worse off. They have the same income, but their money now has lower, lower purchasing power, the higher price level. So counterfeiting is really a subtle met method of fraudulently gaining at the expense of the rest of society through this inflation increase in the money supply process. So, okay, so uh, the last thing, and this is from uh, 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 Hans Hoppe said, uh, and I learned this at my very first Mises University in 1992. Um, he said, we would not expect money to be paper. We would not expect money to be paper because we said money is not intrinsically value. Uh, valued. There's not, um, <clears throat> it's not going to be able to command a lot in exchange. It doesn't have a, a high value in exchange. Also, we would not expect money to be national because then at the border, we're back to double coincidence of wants problem, right? I, I have to have, um, I have to find somebody who has francs and wants dollars when I want, when I have dollars and want francs. So then we're back to that problem of double coincidence of wants. Then also, we wouldn't expect it to be under the control of any particular entity. We wouldn't expect it to be that because uh, we could have just the money supply adjusting uh, with the price uh, as a money supply. Uh, sorry, any money supply would work just as well as any other amount of money through changes in the price level. Right, and the purchasing power of money or the value of money in exchange adjusts so that every single, um, every single uh, exchange can be, can be facilitated. So um, we would not expect it to be under the control of any um, entity. Um, so why do, we have, why do we have national paper money under the control of a central bank? Why is that? Well, it turns out as we saw with the counterfeiters, the counterfeiters who get the money first and get to spend the money, <clears throat> get to spend the money first uh, with their favored, um, with their favored retailers, right, with their favorite stores, 
they buy there first, um, and then uh, that money then spreads out uh, into the rest of the economy, and we have uh, the price purchasing power uh, of money falls as the price level rises. And so what happens is we have just transferred a good deal of wealth away from people late in the process to the people who get to spend early. And so um, this is a very valuable tool. I would argue that the monopoly and the provision of money is really the most desirable of all tools um, for the state. And so that's why we see, that's why we see the way that we have the money the way it is today. Okay, thank you.